Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next session within our operational agility stream. Actually, when I look back at, at last year, when we were doing the same conference in 2020, we were hoping the next time we would come together, it would be more a face-to-face -face type of normal gathering. However, that turned out to be a wishful thinking. Nevertheless, I think as of today, we can be quite hopeful and sure that next time we meet, we will be having a cup of coffee together. My name is Tomek Bugaski. I'm the Managing Director for EMEA Region at Ibaotech. And with Ibaotech, we are serving the industry uh, of insurance across the globe with more than 200 clients in more than 30 countries. Personally, I've been working in the insurance space for 26 years. Prior to joining Ibaotech, I spent several years at the uh, European-based global uh, insurance company and before that within management consultancy. Today, I would like to talk to you about a very important um, subject, something that we've heard so far already quite a lot, but I would like to put it in a bit of a different perspective. I would like to talk about different ways of embracing the actual transformation path and also share with you some lessons and experience from those different projects. Before we dive into those different paths, uh, let's just quickly revisit what we think, how we think the future of insurance will play out for us. Definitely insurance will be not anymore a standalone offering. It will be embedded, injected in other goods and services around travel, health, um, daily chores, hobbies that we have. And that actually in itself uh, gives us quite huge potential and attractive potential. Why? Insurance is changing from sort of blanket type of uh, coverage for predefined period of time to more of a, I only want it when I need it, uh, where I need it, and for as long as I need it. So the usage base. And that in itself creates a different dimension for insurance where it becomes more and more transactional. So it's no longer process inward oriented, it's actually transactions. This is how we interact with our clients on a more frequent basis. And this is actually good because um, the, the more we interact with the client, um, the chances are that the client will be happy with us and then, of course, will spend a, a bit more money with us. And th those clients um, are actually all about and after convenience and not necessarily price only. So that also, if, if we address that properly, if we give them convenience that they expect from us, um, like they are dealing with, with Amazon, Googles and others of this world, um, we can charge a little bit of a higher price and, and till the balance away from the comparison driven aggregator type of business. So that's the future of insurance. What does technology have to offer us to actually tackle that and implement that? Well, let's just focus on the last four or five years where we've been seeing the key elements within technology, cloud nativity, microservices, API economy, big data, AI, DevOps, you know, we all know these buzzwords and, and we'll try to uh, look into them in detail and see how they can effectively help us in our transformational journey. Now, we also know that we have to address a new set of challenges. So there is the massive volumes, massive variation, massive velocity of transactions and data that's hitting us from the business and system point of view as well. Now, so we have these technologies, new technologies, we just need to apply them smartly and properly. Um, what we have been observing is that the contemporary core systems are typically engineered in a sort of monolithic way. So they combine end-to-end -end functionalities both horizontally across the policy or claim life cycle, as well as vertically from back to front office. And such architecture is not really geared up to handle the rapid expansion of the digital insurance or connected insurance. Those systems are robust, but slow. They have been designed for enterprise rather than speed and connectivity and convenience, which will be key going forward. So whether that this the rate of adding and changing the products or the cost of making those changes or ability to connect ourselves and scale to support all the various new business models and external parties, mobile apps, etc. All this needs to happen very, very fast. It's changing very fast. And it creates a lot of technology complexity that core systems and back office systems simply don't handle very well. So let's look at the way how to actually do it different way. And we have introduced, we have been seeing more and more of our clients actually embracing the middle office 
architecture patterns to relieve that tension between the front office and the back office. So the front office layer that we see here is actually the client engagement layer. The middle office is the layer where we can orchestrate those uh, services and we can leverage all of these good technologies that we talked about before. And the back office becomes more of a system of record and deals with mostly offline transactions. So we're now going to use that three layer view to actually look at our different transformation paths. So path number one, what we call InsureTech or Greenfield approach. So that could be a, a, you know, a new layer, new kid on the block disruptor, or um, a, let's say within an established uh, carrier, there can be um, a new Greenfield initiative and innovation, a new line of business, new product, new distribution channel that's being launched. How does that play out in our three layer view? Now let's look at the middle office layer first. So from the product point of view, we, that, that type of uh, transform, digital transformation focuses on few, relatively few and simple products, so travel damage home. Then in terms of the actual services, insurance services and transactions uh, for these required for these products, they're also few and, and relatively simple. So quote, bind, issue, first notice of loss, there's sometimes some renewals, some cancellations, but not really a lot of complexity there. And what's really important uh, here is that we also uh, make use of a lot of other non-insurance services. So third-party APIs to enrich the risk data, uh, give us a better insight into underwriting models, AI tools, blockchain, et cetera. I'll make a, a, a certain um, talk about some specific cases uh, later. So we have the transaction part of our middle office. Now we also have the orchestration part, and this is really where um, the insurance services get combined with those other non-insurance services to create customer journeys, distribution journeys um, that we think uh, will differentiate ourselves in the market. So here are just a few examples. Um, there's of course a, a great leverage and use of automated risk data sourcing to improve underwriting and customer experience. Some of the clients are uh, even accepting cryptocurrency as a payment method. Um, others are doing it in a bit more contextual way, the meshing up of the API. So they're, for example, suggesting additional theft coverage for motor insurance when a vehicle is actually entering a zone or parking within a zone of higher theft uh, risk occurrence. Others um, have been implementing automated claim uh, triggering by real time um, from real time sources like uh, you know, you may be sitting on, on, on an airplane, which, which is delayed, and, and already you have a claim amount uh, hitting your bank account because uh, clients are sourcing the data from real-time flight time plan and database and APIs. Or uh, yet another example of, of blockchain um, where claim payout is actually defined within a smart contract, which is then triggered by some external event. Um, and of course, your typical AI tools like chatbots, um, sort of object uh, recognition, um, OCR, NLP type of things um, for, for pricing, damage assessment, et cetera. So that's the middle of this layer view. Now, um, when we look at the front end layer, engagement layer, um, the orchestration is actually gets exposed and connected to own apps, own portals, or embedded into third party apps and portals in the form of insurance as a service, IAS. So we have the external front ends, or apps, and we have also the group of type of internal front ends. So those are the apps that our, so that the staff, internal staff are actually using to process some of the transactions. So those typically in our insured greenfield approach, they are simple apps focusing on one and done end-to-end -end functionality. So the final layer here is the back office layer, and it's really uh, only comprising of few and simple integration points. So there's let's say a border exchange, there is some accounting general ledger system, there may be some data lake, data warehouse type of systems around. So that's really um, our first path, sort of easiest one, right? Now let's look into some of the uh, experience and lessons learned from here. It's really, because it so, seems to be so simple, it's really best to start with and warm up and, 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 and it gives us uh, a very good um, starting point and immersion into the larger transformation program that you can start building up from here. 
Now, the minimal viable product focus is really important here. And I think uh, InsureTechs understand it and, and more and more uh, incumbents also understand it. But the good thing here is that we have technology uh, already now available to us so that when we build MVP, we can already build for scale from day one. So we don't have, what it means is we don't have to throw away MVP after three months because it's not scaling. If we use the architecture and the technologies we discussed before properly, you can actually scale out and build out the MVP into the future. Also, what's really important across all of the different transformation approaches, but I mentioned it here with the first one is that we need to really pay much more attention to datafication and not just digitalization. So smart datafication means you're not just moving your code by an issue process from offline to purely online experience. You're actually trying to define your product in a way that when you interact with your customer, you gather data and that data allows you to improve your product, your interactions with the client in a continuous iterative way. And we'll have some examples later on um, to share with you how some of the clients have been doing that. All right, so path number two, something we call two-speed architecture. And here, the focus of the transformation really shifts to addressing the existing complexities, ring fencing in existing assets while gearing up for the future. So um, this is really the most common path for many of our clients dealing with legacy issue. Um, so you're no longer a startup, you're, you don't run some innovation or incubation thing, you're trying to digitize your entire existing book of business. And it has been even championed and, and, and done um, successfully by some international carriers that implemented the two-speed architecture on, so we'll see in a second what it looks like, on top of their existing core systems across four and even more countries regionally. So it, it is applicable to small, medium, as well as large layers. Now, how does it look? So starting with middle office layer, of course, we have many more and products than in our greenfield situation, and they are more complex. Um, what it entails is, of course, that the corresponding services and transactions are also more complex. So we're looking into uh, the life cycle, full life cycle of policy and claim, reinsurance, etc. And of course, we still have the access and ability to work with non-insurance third-party APIs. So when we look at the orchestration of these transactions and APIs, this is actually you know, one of the reasons why we're doing that. Um, it, it has to be done properly. So all of the uh, elements of the DevOps um, that I didn't mention for path one, but they are equally important there, you know, we need to be able to manage our APIs. You need to be able to um, orchestrate them. You need to be able to extend them and build those services on the fly. So that's also part of our middle office layer. So what really makes the two-speed architecture unique is that you have the back office layer in which you actually operate your legacy as system of record. And of course, as we mentioned before, the middle office takes care of the real-time transactions and processes and, and does orchestration and connects to the top end, front end. And the back office layer would take care of those um, offline sort of uh, non uh, real time non mission uh, critical in the client sense or distribution sense processes. So the back office is, is of course a bit thicker and the integration a bit more complex than in our first example. Finally, the engagement layer, the top layer, few uh, changes here compared to uh, first path. Of course, we're also integrating external front ends with traditional channels not only with the new ones, so there's additional complexity here, and internal front ends, they're becoming a bit more complex um, because of course we have much more complex transactions to deal with internally. And typically we have large number of teams and staff grouped differently like call, cent call center people, back office admin teams, and they also tend to use these apps um, in a more of an enterprise way, should I say. Let's look at the key learnings from uh, the two-speed architecture type of projects. Number one, we need to uh, avoid overcomplicating uh, the, you know, the implementations and, and avoid falling back into monolithic patterns. So remember when we talked about <clears throat> the monolithic core systems from then um, back end meshed up together, end to end, all lines of business, 
you know, we need to really be careful not to repeat the same mistakes. Um, and that's, that has to do with the cultural change and also how we've been doing things in the past. So we need to really um, be careful about that. Now, the second point is we should stick to the future proof landscape. So, you know, it's the middle office part that should be growing and back office shrinking and not the other way around. So if you have a temptation to, to take some shortcuts and build something quickly, extend your back office because it's easier um, uh, now, uh, please don't do it. Do it in the middle office and the future will thank you for that. And uh, it's not always possible to, of course, apply the two-speed architecture in cases when legacy technology, so uh, database software operating software is no longer supported. That's not really a viable option. But again, this, the two-speed architecture is the key, uh, not the key, let's say, but this the largest subset of all of the different transformations that we have been running with our clients um, globally. The third path to the digital transformation of the digital world is actually what we call here rebuild. And this is really heavy lifting with the main goal to actually build the entire landscape with the new technologies that we discussed before and do away completely with existing legacy. So let's look at how it plays out. Middle office layer, um, similar to um, in terms of the, the thickness and complexity to our 2 -tier architecture, but remember here we are not um, keeping existing legacy. So we, by nature of that, you know, our middle office will need, the scope will increase a bit. So it will be thicker than the uh, two uh, tier architecture. So looking at the products first, it's still many and complex products with high variability, but what changes here, what we observed uh, with our clients is that the mentality moves away from your traditional insurance product thinking to more of a, a stock keeping unique thinking. So the uh, fast moving consumer goods industry where you have few main your technical insurance products and a lot of variations around them with a lot of campaigns, plans, etc., cetera, um, to manage. So those are the SQ, SQUs here. Now, insurance services, uh, there's many and complex of them. Um, you know, we are having things that previously were uh, kept at the back office layer. So we're seeing also finance, you know, complex reinsurance, batch processing, et cetera. We are, doing away with legacy, as we said. So we have more of that complexity here. And of course, we still have access and you know an ability to, to reuse the existing solutions, APIs, and services from, from other vendors. Now, the orchestration um, is really important here. Um, and of course, um, this is, the again, the, the core of the middle office layer. So um, key here is that um, we are actually able to combine those insurance services with other services and do that in a proper DevOps way. The back office layer, as I mentioned, it's becoming thinner again compared to the two-speed architecture. We have no legacy core. We have the peripheral systems to integrate with. From the front-end point of view, I think external front-end apps uh, pretty much the same as in our two-speed architecture. What changes a little bit is that internal front-ends are different because we are building from scratch. We're actually leveraging the new technology. So the microservices, remember, they allow us to create applications only for the purpose that we need them to be. They don't have to be end-to-end -end monolithic. You can have a collection of apps, each serving a particular business scenario. So we've had clients who are building policy admin app for travel insurance, um, and also another policy admin for motor insurance or for motor fleet claim for motor, et cetera, claim for health. So you have a collection of apps instead of one sort of, or, or, or two apps for internal purposes. And that aligns you much closer and better with your front-end apps and how you actually uh, connect to your end clients and distribution system. So that alignment is much better here. Now, the key lessons learned from that, don't try this at home, that's the first one. Really, it's a big, uh, think it, you need to have a proper budget, proper buying um, of the stakeholders and proper management um, to do that. 
uh, it's better to build the necessary skills in-house rather than get the system integrators to do your DevOps and, and extension orchestrations, keep that knowledge in-house because you want to be fast and agile in the future. That's why you're building it in the first place. Finally, follow a phased approach. So don't do a big band, you know, do the whatever it is, some apps, some lines of business, etc. Because the world changes fast, and as we said before, and even if you decide to stop somewhere on the way without being completely finished, you're still ahead of the game. You haven't built new legacy. You haven't implemented yet another core system monolithic end to end. You just created certain application from to back for the particular purpose. And you can still combine that application with your existing landscape and bring, take it with you into the future. Path number four, ecosystem or marketplace. Um, here we're taking it really to the next level and building our own or ecosystem or in injecting sort of ourselves into an ecosystem, already existing ecosystem in a horizontal way across multiple industries. So what does it really mean? I think product um, pretty much the same as we've seen before, transactions, they're not a big difference. Services um, and APIs. Here, the key is we're not only dealing with insurance related services or other services which are supplementary to insurance. We are also able to actually build new non-insurance related services. So for example, um, we can be adding gamification into the customer journey. We can be creating customer wallets, insurance or financial wallets. We can be getting into lifestyle management functionality. All of these new services you can actually extend build on your middle office layer and then you have them as well available to do the orchestration properly. And as you see, the orchestration is really the key, the core part of the ecosystem marketplace, where you see the very deep and broad um, um, combination and, and mashups of the insurance and non-insurance related APIs and services. So a few, few examples how we've been seeing that uh, playing out. Um, for example, offering a bike insurance together with a bike lock. So um, the customer is buying the, uh, getting a policy and at the same time, he is getting a, a lock purchased from an affiliated e-commerce website. And that transaction is actually orchestrated in a seamless way. So as soon as he gets the uh, <clears throat> email or PDF with the policy document, he also gets the transaction confirmation that he, his uh, bike lock is also on the way. So that's how you go beyond one industry and orchestrate across horizontally. Now, another example, car dealers and manufacturers creating mobility ecosystem, orchestrating customer journeys um, beyond just insurance, um, organizing assistance, hotel, alternative travel, um, triggering reaper network management, all of that. Another ex example, large e-commerce players who start to provide embedded insurance to their existing clients buying goods and services with insurance attached to it. Yet another example, commercial line insurers. So it's not, not only applicable to personalized, also to commercial lines, leveraging real-time IoT data feeds to actually avoid under or over insuring inventory of their clients across large distributed number of warehouses. So you can see also the benefit to the client. It's not just paying the right premium based on usage sort of, uh, but it's also making sure that when the claim uh, needs to be filed, that you're actually properly insured and you're not underinsured, right? So all of these, all of these examples are actually quite key here. So let's just finish this. Uh, back office layer, how it looks really depends on the uh, starting situation. So I'm not going to, to go any deeper into it. It can be one of the previous three uh, situations. From the front end engagement layer, a bit of a difference here. Uh, we tend to see more of those own mega apps or own platforms with cockpits, customers not just dealing with insurance part of the equation, so to speak, but also along uh, with um, all of these other, you know, um, whatever we said, mobility, health, etc. So a big one, big cockpit or app, mega app, where we um, interact with the with the customer. Internal front ends not not really a, a big difference. Key learnings from here. Well, ecosystem marketplace is really the, the target state to which all other paths should be. The, 
word of wisdom here is pick your battles wisely because you cannot create or be the leader in all ecosystems. It's okay to have one or maybe to even have none, but be able to nimbly and, 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 and very agile way to inject yourself into other ecosystems. You don't always have to be either. You can provide your services as an um, adapter into an existing ecosystem. Finally, it's hardest to implement, but has the highest potential for exponential growth um, and also staying um, relevant in front of our clients in the future. So really what we've been talking about today is, is has several uh, paths and examples on, on getting digital. And common area has always been the ability to orchestrate across insurance and non-insurance APIs. And this is possible uh, for all paths and key elements of any digital transformation. Really. It is really about moving from a system-driven transformation approach to a platform-driven one. And truly the end game is that the digital transformation needs to ensure true business scalability and not just a technical scalability. And this requires ability to handle large volumes and variations of data and transactions that we've seen and with high velocity. And that's exactly where the middle office way offers the most compelling benefits. Here, I would like to stop and thank you for your attention. And of course, I would like now open the floor for questions.